At Fisher Investments, creating your portfolio starts with an understanding of your investing goals, investment time horizon, and personal circumstances. From there, we add our unique investment process and decades of expertise to develop a plan to help you reach your goals. As a client, your portfolio will be managed by the Investment Policy Committee, a team with over 100 years of combined industry experience that makes investing decisions for the firm. They construct portfolios for both institutional and private clients using stocks, bonds, cash or other securities depending on client needs. In the following video, you'll hear Investment Policy Committee member Bill Glasser, along with other senior members of the firm, discuss how the research department is structured to support the Investment Policy Committee and how the firm selects stocks and bonds for client portfolios through a disciplined investment process. Supporting the Investment Policy Committee, we have a group of over 50 investment professionals and very much like other parts of the firm, we believe in the specialization of labor. And so those 50 individuals are broken up into distinct teams with distinct responsibilities. Now I want to spend a little bit of time talking about those teams and how they interact with the Investment Policy Committee. The first relates to the applied research part of the process. You can think of the applied research part of the process as the fundamental research that we conduct. And there's two teams that help us conduct that research. You've got the capital markets team and the securities research team. Now the capital markets analysts, these are the individuals that help us with our broad macroeconomic research across countries and sectors. Now, the securities research team, as the name would imply, these are the individuals that are responsible for following the stocks that we own in client portfolios or might seek to add to client portfolios. The other team that's most germane to the investment process is our capital markets innovation team. And these are the individuals that are responsible for our theoretical research and our risk control. So in essence, when you think about theoretical research, this is the statistical work that we do, the quantitative work that we do, and this is a bit of a different team in the sense that they're trying to uncover new and unique insights that we can then use to augment the fundamental research aspects of our process. And so these individuals, they're tasked with coming up with new capital markets technology, new capital markets innovation. And some recent examples of work that we've done involves understanding the shape of the yield curve and what that might be telling us about different categories of the market that might do well or might do poorly. We've done a lot of work in understanding what sectors and categories of the market would do in a rising rate environment. We've also uncovered a lot of work that looks at the relationship between commodity cycles. And when you get tremendous amounts of capital expenditures and a lot of supply coming online, what does that mean for the energy sector and many of the big mining companies out there across the world? So together, the capital markets research team, the securities research team, and the capital markets innovation team collectively all help the investment policy committee in determining the categories of the market we want exposure to, the stocks that we want exposure to, and various new unique relationships that we can identify. Now, there's a very high degree of collaboration amongst these teams. And if you've ever had an opportunity to visit our office in Woodside, you'll see that we've got a very much of an open architecture environment. There are no offices, there are no cubicles. So we truly operate and communicate with each other, with the other analysts on a real-time basis. Our trading team is responsible largely for trade execution, reconciliation, and the operational logistics uh, for executing trades in your account. And the way that it works is that the Investment Policy Committee will make a decision to buy or sell a specific security in your account. And that is then translated very directly to a group called the Implementation Team that is tasked with putting orders into each one of your accounts. And from there, the trading group actually goes out and uses our network of global brokers to execute those trades. And when we're managing portfolios, there's clearly thousands and thousands of stocks for us to choose from, and we're not examining each and every one of those. So we've got to come up with a, an efficient way to narrow down that universe, and our investment process is really predicated on three major steps. 
our investment process begins with an analysis of higher level drivers that we think are either going to advantage or disadvantage certain categories of stocks. We tend to divide those drivers into three main categories, economic drivers, political drivers, and sentiment drivers. So an example could pertain to the energy sector, for instance. In an environment where we think the economic environment is going to drive more demand for oil, the political environment with instability in places like the Middle East could cause shocks to oil supply that will drive prices up. And from a sentiment standpoint, looking at things like speculation within energy futures markets, we use all of that information to come up with a higher level theme about whether or not we want to be overweight or underweight to the energy sector. Once we've decided what categories of the market we want to be overweight and underweight to, we can then whittle down our choice set of stocks even further by applying various quantitative factor screens. So at points in the market and economic cycle, we might prefer value stocks over growth stocks or large stocks over small stocks. We can use capitalization and valuation metrics to whittle down our choice set of stocks even further. We can also focus on other factors we might find favorable, things like balance sheet strength or liquidity or other quantitative factors that again take that larger pool of stocks and whittle it down to a much more manageable list. So going back to my energy example, we might decide that rather than focusing on the big integrated energy companies which tend to be much larger from a capitalization standpoint, we want to focus more on smaller exploration and production companies or service companies or other companies that might be smaller cap focused. By the time we've moved to the third step of the process, we made a country decision, a sector decision, many times an industry decision. We've run a number of portfolio screens, whether they're liquidity, solvency, valuation and capitalization, and now we've arrived in an investment universe that might be anywhere from five to 20 different names. Now this is where the securities analyst comes into play. And this is a much more manageable list for them to do their true fundamental analysis or, the, or their due diligence. So now we get into the fundamental part of the process and this is where we begin with our review of strategic attributes. And when we think about strategic attributes, these are really just competitive advantages that a company might have. It could be a high relative market share, maybe they have low cost of production, maybe they have an asset sensitive balance sheet or a liability sensitive balance sheet and get a benefit from rising or falling interest rates. Any of these are plausible competitive advantages. But we know that's not enough because none of this is proprietary, so there we need to take the process one step further. And that's where we begin our execution analysis. And here we're asking ourselves, what is the management team doing in terms of its deeds and its actions to take advantage of those competitive advantages? But we know that's not enough because a company could have great advantages and they could be executing well, but if that's recognized by the rest of the investment community, that doesn't give us much of an information advantage. So this is where we bring in relative valuations. And we want to understand how is the stock trading not only to itself historically, but also relative to its peers. In an ideal world, we'd find a stock with great attributes, they're executing well, and trading at a big discount. But many times that's easier said than done, and there are times we might be willing to pay up in terms of a premium if we think the competitive advantages are disproportionate to the price we'd otherwise have to pay. Now one other important point about these strategic attributes is that they're not good for all time. Some attributes will give a stock a particular tailwind at a given point in time, others might give it a particular headwind, and I'll give you an example. Take relative market share, for instance. If you think back to 2006 and 2007, that was a period of time of low interest rates, high M&A activity, a lot of IPO activity, a lot of borrowing and leveraged buyouts. That was a period of time when you wanted to own companies with fairly low relative market shares because those stocks were bid up and had a bit of a premium built into them tied to takeover potential. But now you fast forward to 2008 and 2009, and all of a sudden the credit crisis unfolds, that premium comes out of those stocks very, very quickly. They tend to be smaller in nature. They don't have the necessary financing to, to finance some of their businesses. That's a period of time when maybe we don't want to favor some of the companies with lower market shares, but we really want to favor the biggest companies with the biggest market shares that are able to finance themselves. So not every strategic attribute is best for all time. Now the last step of the process is what we refer to as a red flag analysis. 
And any stock that makes it this far in the process is subject to a 20-point checklist. And we're looking for things such as labor relation issues, maybe there's management turnover, they got sole suppliers or customer concentrations. Those are things we want to be aware of. And it's not that if one of these are checked off that immediately precludes us from purchasing the stock, but we want to be aware of them before buying the name. The securities analyst will work with the investment policy committee. They'll report their findings on all these different names. It's a very iterative process. It's a collaborative process. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the investment policy committee that's making all the buy-sell decisions in client portfolios. It's also important to note that this process is operating on a continuous basis. It's not as if we do this once, we set it and forget it. But literally, we're going through this process on a daily basis as we think about the different exposures we want across countries, sectors, and as we consider new stocks to add to client portfolios. Bonds are a little different compared to equities. There's different drivers that could move bond prices. Uh, one might be the general direction of interest rates. One may be inflationary expectations. So we have to look out at the bond market and, and obviously have a forecast similar to our stock forecast. In which areas do we think we could capitalize with regards to what bonds are available? So for example, you have the treasury market, you have the corporate bond market, you have the municipal market, you also have agency bonds. So there's a, there's a lot of different vehicles and bond strategies that one could look at. The big one is we're trying to generate total return for our client's portfolio. So this is important in essence because we're looking for appreciation as well as the coupon that those bonds provide. So we're looking at forecast for interest rate risk, inflationary risk, what has better value in, at that time, and that's an ongoing managed process similar to our stock accounts. One of the predominant reasons why bonds will fluctuate is the outlook for, for future interest rates. So we may have an outlook, for example, that interest rates may be coming down in the immediate future, but if something causes that to change where rates may start to go back up, we may have to reposition the portfolio to more shorter maturity, shorter duration bonds, so we're not exposed to that interest rate volatility. So our change in our forecast would be one simple reason why we could reposition the bond portfolios. So what does our investment process do for you? As a Fisher Investments client, you can feel confident knowing every security in your portfolio has passed a detailed screening process before being carefully selected by the Investment Policy Committee. This disciplined process is designed to manage risk and ultimately to help you reach your financial goals. If you'd like to learn more about the process the Investment Policy Committee uses to manage portfolios like yours, please contact us at 1-800-568-5082. One of our local representatives in your area would be happy to sit down with you to answer your questions.